All right, hey, everybody. So thanks so much. I'm John Stoltz. I'm with the Android Systems team, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about proxy execution. Um, so there's been a lot of really great folks who have worked on proxy execution for a fairly long time. Um, so I'm just kind of the <laughs> least of these. I feel like a lot of big brains that have gone into this. So uh, I gave a talk at uh, OSPM in April, and uh, a lot of the stuff I'm going to kind of zip over quickly. Um, so if you're curious for more, you can follow the link for that slide there. Um, so first of all, why do we care? Well, with Android, um, we really want to be able to enforce the priority before doing foreground and background tasks. We want to make sure those background tasks aren't chewing up the battery, um, as well as you know not interrupting the foreground task. Um, and unfortunately, with Android, we aren't able to give kind of untrusted applications real-time priority uh, to solve this. Um, and so instead, we end up with this mix of kind of like C groups and nice values to try to basically throttle the background tasks so that they don't interrupt the foreground tasks. Um, this, however, hits a ton of priority and version problems. Um, and priority inheritance isn't something that works for SCED other tasks. Um, and so just as a result, we aren't able to usefully throttle background tasks without causing a lot of inconsistent behavior for our foreground tasks. Uh, and this is kind of a big issue for us. Um, so proxy execution is kind of a generalized form of priority inheritance. It's a very simple idea. Basically, we're just going to track the blocked-on relationship between the mutex waiters and the uh, mutex owners. Um, the odd part here is that we're then going to keep all of the uh, blocked mutex tasks on the run queue, even though they're not runnable. Um, we're then going to let the scheduler pick the most important task between the, blocked mute the mutex block tasks and the runnable tasks. If it picks a mutex block task, we traverse that blocked on chain and find a runnable owner and run it instead. So this seems very simple, um, but it of course gets very complicated. Uh, there's issues with these blocked on chains can cross CPUs. And so we have to do migrations uh, to basically to the runnable owner CPUs. Um, additionally, uh, we might have a chain that resolves into a sleeping owner. And in that case, we can't do anything to, to kind of boost it to run. And so in that case, we DQ uh, the, the block task uh, off of the run queue and then queue it onto the blocked, uh, the sleeping owner's task so that when it wakes up, we can wake it up uh, as well. Um, and there's lots of other complications as well. Um, so the reason why, despite these complexities, we're kind of interested in this is that uh, this is kind of a uh, simple reproducer that I created uh, to illustrate the problem that we see. Uh, we have two tasks kind of doing file system operations, uh, kind of contending on various file system locks. Um, and with uh, vanilla at the top, as soon as we add CPU share limiting to throttle the background task, we start seeing really bad outliers in our foreground tasks. Um, and of course, using proxy execution, this resolves that issue completely. So it's, it's very attractive. Um, so since OSPM, I've sent out three versions of the patch series. It's taken a lot, <laughs> it's been a lot more work than I was hoping. Um, uh, kind of V5 was kind of the biggest rework of the series. I basically took, you know, the seven patches I think it was before and split it into something like 40 fine grain patches so I could kind of test each minor step and really try to stabilize the series. Um, lots of fixes and reworks in that. Um, there's some stuff where I rechanged things like the return migration. So if we proxied and migrated, if we migrated a task for, to proxy uh, uh, a runnable owner. Um, once it gets the lock back, it may not be able to run on that CPU. So we have to return it uh, back to uh, the, the CPU it was running on. Um, this was done in the try to wake up path, but it was very racy. And so I just kind of went with a very slow and simple path of just moving it uh, to schedule. And so it's one of those things where this gets kind of messy with a lot of blocks. This introduced some performance regressions. Um, I haven't gotten a whole lot of feedback. Uh, last week I sent out uh, the V6. This one stabilized the sleeping owner in queuing, which I had left out at V5, um, and also added some uh, conditionalization on all the logic. So we're able to build it in, but disable it at, at boot time. Um, yeah, got a little bit of feedback on this so far, but not, not too much. Um, kind of my current set of issues of the sleeping owner and queuing was really difficult to get right. Um, we end up with this case of we have a lot of tasks sort of enqueued on other tasks. Um, and just in order to do the locking properly with this, we're having kind of a lot of the same top level locks that we have to take to, to handle this safely. Um, it feels a little bit like I'm kind of recreating a run queue in a way. Um, additionally, it's super complicated because there's can be mid-chain wake up. So we can have these enqueued owners and something can be woken up midway through, which is kind of unexpected from the way wound mutexes. Um, I can talk a little bit about more at that later if people are interested. Um, 
the uh, again the return migration moving it into schedule it's slow but it was at least correct um, I need to think about how to rework this because we're often kind of running in the wrong order on the lock on the locks uh, or we end up having to kind of swim upstream of the locks uh, for the locking order and so I, I need to find a kind of a better approach there move it back into the try to wake up uh, path um, obviously sorting out the regression since before is a thing to do. Um, and then the other part is that OSPM, we talked a little bit about some optimizations that might be interesting to do where, you know, maybe we could avoid migrations if the owner is actually running on another CPU and we knew that. Um, unfortunately, these blocked on chains can traverse multiple uh, run queues. And so we're somewhat limited to how far we can look ahead to determine if the task is running on that queue. And so um, that kind of inherently limits a little bit of how far we can uh, do those optimizations at this point. Um, so if folks have ideas for that, that would be great. Um, the other big concern I have is just the scheduler is already fairly subtle. So I'm very worried about adding more complexity here. Um, so for discussion, so real practical questions. I haven't gotten a lot of feedback on the series. Um, I did split it up from you know kind of four to seven uh, very large patches. Uh, to, I guess, my internal tree is like 40, but I send out about 20. I've kind of compressed them down a little bit. And trying to figure out what's the right level of fine grainness because I know at 20 patches, that's still kind of imposing for folks to review. Um, ideas for how to kind of break this up so that we can maybe stage it slowly over time might be a good idea. Uh, any, any sort of feedback on that would be great. Um, additionally, I, you know, don't know if, do we need to ship it first for folks to take it seriously? Um, I really, just kind of the last decade of my life, I've been really wanting to avoid Android divergence. Um, and so it's really important to the team that we, we, we don't do that. But at the same time, this is a really critical issue. Vendors are always already doing very creative solutions in their own trees. Um, and uh, we really would like to have a common solution in the near term. Um, Hey, John. Yeah. Uh, I was curious. Uh, there was that issue where uh, this stuff doesn't play well with RT push pull. So, because you might have a chain yes, that is chain. behind an RT task. So that, you yeah. push that. There's so, a patch that we have uh, Connor implemented a while back. And I've been, as I've been moving through the stack stabilizing things, that's kind of the last bit that I have as well. So, I've been working on that recently. I haven't sent it out yet, okay. or at least since before. Um, but that's uh, a thing I want to make sure it's really solid, but it does, I, I think it will resolve the issue. Okay, so, um, sounds good. Um, <clears throat> so if you're worried about, you know, doing Android like out of tree thing, I mean, if you look at it as something that you're trying to make upstream, at least I know we kind of do this on Chrome. If something that's focused upstream and we're kind of working with the upstream community and we'll say, well, let's just, it's working. It seems to work for us. We'll pull it in and actually would actually deploy it even though you're worried about you know, technical debt, but it's not really a technical debt. It's actually more of, a, it's sort of like the spiral type of development where you're actually kind of working with upstream. Technical debt is when you just fork on something and you ignore upstream at all. Yeah, one, one of the issues is that there are, uh, you know, and I, I would say that would be ideally the case, but it, it's one of those things where there's a lot of stuff already in the Android tree where I think that was an, even the original intent. And so it's once it is in the tree, it becomes difficult to, get out because again, the vendors have their own very oh, eccentric and creative solutions that they're using to solve this. If they start relying on this, it's not something that we can just simply drop. That's right, that's, um, why, that's the difference between Android and Yeah, Chrome. and so this, this it gets very <laughs> difficult. So it's one of those things where I want to avoid that, but I also want folks to be able to kind of figure out how do we kind of make some movement on this. Yeah, hi, uh, yeah. I feel like your job makes that be accurate quite difficult. So I have uh, some, uh, uh, situations. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Why is, uh, are you still kind of uh, are always ignoring CPU affinity when you do this thing? Because uh, they might, might run into some problems because uh, like some bare metal like applications might have some certain uh, assumptions about the cache interference and other effects of performance. Uh, or maybe there's process for CPU assumptions. Uh, what would you uh, do you think? So as far as the CPU affinity, so we don't take that into account when we do the proxy migration. So it's that aspect of when we have a uh, lock owner that's on another CPU and we have an, high, um, an important task that's on a different CPU that needs to run, but it is, is blocked on that mutex. We migrate it off to the other CPU. It doesn't actually run on that CPU. It just sits on the run queue and basically is there to boost the task. So it's there for selection so that we end up running that task. Right. So it releases the lock. As soon as it releases the lock, this task becomes runnable again. 
and it should migrate back to where it okay. was. So the hard part a, is. Yeah. I, I was just saying. Uh, I was just saying the the punchline is as long as you're not running affinity doesn't matter. No, you're, when you're blocked, you want to give your you want to give you want to proxy someone else, so you get. Yeah. <laughs> I was saying the affinity is still the one of the lock owner, which is actually taking the other parameters, but the affinity, so the lock owner still runs on the CPUs or on CPU that is running. We are not migrating the local, the local owner. We are migrating whoever is donating to the local owner. So the affinity of who's running is actually maintained. So it's more like a credit exchange kind of thing. Uh, so you don't have to migrate, actually. You can just uh, uh, put some kind of credit. Yeah, the, the uh, task doesn't actually migrate to run on another core. It's just that the task on the run queue, gets, it moves to a different run queue. We don't actually I mean, do any running of that task. Like in theory, you actually don't have to migrate the task. You can just migrate some metrics. That should also. So. No, it's not that easy. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say for, from a, uh, the task point of view, it doesn't know it migrated. Yeah, that's that's the thing. So the task user space doesn't realize this is happening. So it's an implementation detail. So when you get migrated to another CPU, the task doesn't execute on that other CPU. So the task will never know it was migrated to that CPU and and then come back out. It's sort of similar when uh, I need to upload a slide and I have to, and I have to be presenters. I'll steal the presenter from him. He won't know it. I'll upload the slide and give him back to presenter. He never switched over, but um, so in theory, he stayed on the same presenter. So, <laughs> meanwhile, Steven's done the presentation. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's, uh, yeah, it's an implementation trick. I mean, instead of creating, let's say, another RB3 with the uh, uh, chains of the, the lock chain, we use the uh, essentially the scheduler RB3. So you migrate the uh, the donors to the same RB3. The scheduler will be selecting a task from, and then let the, the scheduler select the highest priority and that that one will uh, be used by the lock the the, the lock owner uh to, to actually be scheduled it's kind of a, an implementation implementation trick but i mean the lock owner is not migrating yeah, that's, it's like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> i say it's more like a counting or metric uh trick is that uh, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Why don't we okay. talk some more about it? Because yeah. I can get into the details uh, in the log. Okay. Quickly. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, quickly, the next question uh, is that, like, I think when you do dealing with party version, you don't want any leaks. Uh, we kind of want to cover all the uh, locking cases, all the dependencies. Uh, so, what do you think about this, uh, like, reader writer logs and uh, maybe multiple logs? This uh, kind of uh, a graph like a dependency. So this is another thing that has come up is that folks are very interested. A lot of the contention that we see where we see the priority inversion also happens on semaphores and read write locks. And so that's an area that I'm going to, after we can get this working stably, I'm kind of see how we can expand it to, to support those as well. Um, because uh, I think uh, Thomas, is he here, whatever? Pretty step out and not come in. Yeah. But uh, because I don't know, I don't know how, how complex this is compared to like priority inheritance. Mm -hmm. But we gave up on reader writer logs. Okay. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it was just it was just way too it too complex. It was almost impossible to uh, prove that it was correct. Right. So we just kind of gave up on reader writer locks yeah. on priority inheritance. Uh, we just said if you use reader writer locks, here he is. So yeah. press away real quick. Uh, yes. I, <laughs> so. <laughs> so, Thomas, uh, the question about uh, he's bringing up is for proxy execution on reader writer locks. I don't know really the complexity of uh, proxy execution, but if it's compared anywhere to priority inheritance, then we know how that is with reader writer locks with priority inheritance. He finally just gave up, correct? On that? Um, right, yeah. right, so, yes. Yeah, uh, I mean, give you up might not, not be a good option <laughs> because. We have uh, actually I'm dealing with a real world problem. Uh, uh, they're involving both C group mutex and the uh, uh, C group uh, thread group RW semaphore. So uh, uh, they both kind of getting a party inversion. So if you only fix one, 
actually the other one will show up. That's like a, something you don't want to leak, like memory leak kind of thing. So uh, uh, so that's something to consider. So we might need to <laughs> cover everything to, to get the system work smoothly. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, there's two issues with reader write alerts. So one is you can't do priority inheritance. I mean, Stephen tried and it was an unholy mess and never worked correctly. Um, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, okay, it sometimes worked, but it never worked correctly. <laughs> so, so the thing is, uh, uh, boosting a writer is easy because that's a single entity. But if you have a re multiple readers, which you want for performance, then having one writer coming in, boosting several readers out is just uh, problematic. It doesn't scale um, and it gets messy, especially for backing out. So if if the if the read, the writer does a try lock, um, backing out the whole reader side is total total horror show. Um, so we had a version where we said, okay, writer boosting is important writer boosting readers out is important, so we reduced it to a single reader, which hurts scalability, obviously. So we gave up on that and went back to actually um, just letting the readers boost the writer and have multiple readers again, which can't be boosted, which is prone to um, writer starvation. But, um, 15 years ago, when we looked at this, um, many of the hot paths, uh, reader writer logs were really highly, highly contended, but lots of them, especially networking, moved over to RCU and the problem doesn't exist anymore. So the only one which is still uh, an issue is uh, MemAp SAM, the MemAp reader writer SAM. But on the other hand, I mean, yeah, if you're doing permanent uh, alloc, the alloc of or map and map of memory, yeah, so be it. It's your problem. It, it's it's performance-wise, it's anyway a slow pass, so it can wait a little bit. It's it's not horrible. So we 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 didn't see any on the on on the. Uh, pathological workloads, we didn't see any writer starvation in the last couple of years. So it's, I think it's just, it solved it mostly itself by converting it away from reader writer locks. So I think I only have a minute or two left, but the last thing I just wanted to say is that uh, Sage Sharp had a nice blog post a while back about. Uh, types of reviews. And so I was going to make a small request, which is as folks are kind of looking at uh, the patch series, um, I really would love design, correctness reviews, the polish. You know, I appreciate the grammar checks and things like that, but I just want to make sure that, you know, I, I, I want to make sure these uh, designs are pretty solid uh, before going much further. So. Yeah. Yeah. so one of the big concerns with this stuff that, that I had initially was that you have to migrate the whole chain to, to a CPU, right, to proxy. So the question is like, at what point do you say that the migration is not worth it? And that's, you know, so if you have too much migration, then you're in this meta stable state where you're, you're migrating all the time. Yeah. And that costs too, right? Yeah. So, so chain migration helps a little bit, but it, it is possible to spend a fair amount of time trying to constantly yeah. kick tests around. So, yeah. so that, that, is, that is a concern, but it's, it's I don't know how. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah. One, one last. Oh, wait, wait. Just no. he's no. waiting for the microphone for a quick while. That's it. Not to a question, more of like really the, the like in Android, we see a lot of starvation issues and like the solutions really very important moving forward. And, but it's one of these complex features that highlights that we have a limitation that sometimes the staging something, even if it is not imperfect, it still shows a progress that helps mm -hmm. making some, at least in real world, 
I mean, we still hit corner cases where it will fail, but like it will be less severe than the issues we see. So I would appreciate if there is a way where it can get to a fall where it's not perfect, yes, but it's merchable. It doesn't cause any obvious deadlocks, at least, or breakages, mm -hmm. even if there are corner cases. That will really be very helpful, at yeah. least to help create the products in the real world. I've tried to is not really required stage the patches so they're very small. So a lot of the steps, there's often a lot of cases in the early days where if we just if, if we haven't gotten to that bit of code, we just you know basically put pull the task off the wrong queue. And so there are a lot of those kind of short outs. So we could kind of start a little bit, but I just again I want to make sure people are okay with the whole idea before we get too far. So um, anyway, thank you so much. Thank you.